commissioned by God in the third heaven beyond the stars. Before planet Earth was created, this extraterrestrial lost his position of honor as God's supremely anointed angel and was cast out. He dwells now, as he has since his fall, among the stars. He is the dark prince of the power of the air, and even now, this angel turned devil is preparing to lead his legion of fallen angels against mankind. The warnings of this in the Bible are clear. They warn of extraterrestrials, global invasion approaching. Hello, friends. This is the companion tape to Angels, Mysterious Strangers Among Us. However, we would not be doing justice to the topic of angels if we did not deal with the other side of the coin. And yes, I'm speaking about fallen angels. And so we're going to be dealing with Satan, the fallen angels, where they came from, where they're going to be, what they're doing right now, and all of these things we're going to try and answer on this tape, aren't we, Jack? Rex, there's a lot of hysteria out there because men oftentimes speak about these things and they don't have knowledge as to what the Bible teaches on these subjects. And you get these books and they're loading the bookshelves of the stores, but they are incorrect. We will not say anything today that we cannot base upon the Holy Word of God because that is our source for information, nothing else, as you'll see. Right up front on this tape, I would like to give you two great statements, the first one being about Satan or the devil, the second one being about his agents, the demons. The late Pope Paul VI said this about Satan, Satan is alive and evil. Satan fully exists as an active force in the world. He's a dark enemy agent, a terrible, mysterious, fearsome reality, a live spirit, perverted, and enemy number one. The Pope went on to describe the devil as being a vast malignity, sophistication and treachery, a spirit who is seducing modern men with drugs, pornography, materialism, and the occult. Whole nations, he said, have fallen under Satan's grip. In the Pope's view, modern man relies too much on psychology and psychiatry and sociology to explain the phenomenon of evil. And because of it, he says that we have lost our concept of the supernatural power of wickedness. That is very powerful. We should take that to our heart. The second one, the great Lutheran Christian Hermann Bezel said this, Mankind is demonized to the extent that they believe the demons do not exist. Mm, I think that's very powerful too. Now, Jack, do you believe that the devil and that the demons are real? I have to, Rexella, because I believe 2 Timothy 3.16 all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. The devil is mentioned 60 times by that title, 52 times by the term Satan, one time by the terminology devilish, and then there are a host of names for him as we're going to see a little later in this study. The term devils or demons can be found 55 times, principalities and powers eight times, and evil spirits four times. What does this book have to say about the devil? You're going to see. But very briefly, as we begin this video, 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Ephesians 4, 27 says, neither have any place for the devil. James 4, 7, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And then, of course, in Ephesians 6, 11, it says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And Rexella, the way that one can stand against the devil is by pleading the precious blood of Jesus Christ. For Revelation 12, 11 says, they overcame Satan by the blood of of the Lamb. That is our main source 
of strength when old Slewfoot, the slimy, slithering serpent, Satan, tries to attack us. Oh, Slewfoot, huh? <laughs> Did you know that Lucifer, the devil, or uh, Satan as we know him, is often praised in some groups and in literature? Listen to this. Lucifer is hailed as the bringer of light and the morning star in New Age literature. I did not know that until we started studying for this video. The origin of the idea that Lucifer is equated with light began in Babylonia and Persia from 1400 to 400 BC. During that era, the religious cult of Mithraism thrived. New Age Benjamin Cream, now he is one of the leaders in that group, stated to a radio audience in 28 states and 11 nations that Lucifer came from the planet Venus some 18 and a half million years ago. He went on to say that, and this really gets to me, and I hope it will ring a bell with you, that Lucifer made the supreme sacrifice for our planet and was both the prodigal son and the sacrificial lamb. It is Lucifer, according to Cream, who is responsible for our planetary evolution, including spiritual evolution. Spangler, who is also a New Age leader, has written this about Lucifer. Lucifer works within each of us to bring us to wholeness. And as we move into a new age, which is the age of man's wholeness, each of us in some way is brought to that point, which I term the Luciferic initiation, the particular doorway through which the individual must pass if he is to come fully into the presence of his light and his wholeness. Lucifer comes to us the final gift of wholeness. If we accept it, then he is free, and we are free. Ooh, that really rings a bell with me, Jack. Now, I would like to ask Jack, he's been doing so much studying on this, where did Lucifer begin? Did he come down from Venus like uh, Benjamin Cream said? <laughs> Anybody can say anything. And the New Age bookstores have their shelves lined with things about angels. Of course, they don't say too much about the devil unless it's in praise of Lucifer. But what does the Bible say? Who created him? Genesis 1-1 says, In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Now, when God is praised, the name Yahweh or Jehovah is used. But when it describes some work that God does, the name is Elohim. And that's what one finds in the original Hebrew of Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, Elohim created. Now that's important because anything that ends with I am means a plurality, more than one. Cherubim, seraphim, angels, plurality. All right, can I prove that? Exodus 20 verse 3 says, Thou shalt have no gods before me, but the Hebrew word is, Thou shalt have no Elohim before me, more than one. In the beginning, Elohim, more than one, created heaven and earth, proving right up there in front verse 1 that there's a trinity but God allowed the Lord Jesus Christ who's from old from all eternity Micah 5 2 to perform the job of creation Christ John 1 3 all things were made by Christ and without Christ was not anything made that was made John 1 10 he was in the world and the world was made by him Colossians 1 16 says for by Christ were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created by Christ and for Christ. Watch that term, principalities and powers, for this has to do with angels, good and bad. And Christ created everything in heaven and on earth, it says, visible and invisible. One day when we stand before the Lord, we're rewarded, we'll lay our crowns at His feet, in Revelation 4, verses 10 and 11, and will cry out, Thou art worthy, Christ, to receive glory, honor, and power, for Thou, Lord Jesus, hast created all things, all things. So, Lucifer was created by the Lord Jesus Christ. But he was a wonderful angel in the beginning. And the story is unfolded in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 14 to 16. 
says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou wast perfect in all thy ways from the day that thou wast created until iniquity was found in thee. And then what? Thou wast cast out of the holy mountain of God, the third heaven of 2 Corinthians 12, too. Why? Because he sinned. And what was that sin? Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. We see a number of things here. First of all, he was the anointed cherub. And that's a beautiful angel created to serve and praise God. Secondly, he was upon the holy mountain of God, and that's what God's throne is called. Thirdly, because he sinned, he was cast out of that area, the throne of God, which is that third heaven, as I said, of 2 Corinthians 12, 2. And it was all because of pride, his beauty. Do you know that in 1 Timothy chapter 3, where the qualifications are laid down for ministers, verse 6 says, he should not be a new Christian because in the position of being minister, pride fills him, and as a result, he falls into the same condemnation into which Satan or Lucifer fell because of pride. Now, the scenario is found in Isaiah 14, verses 12 to 14. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did sweep in the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation, God's throne in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the heavens. I I, Lucifer, will be like the Most High God. He had eye trouble. He should have seen a good optometrist. There is the pride we just mentioned a moment ago. And, of course, he fell from his position. And he can no longer enter the third heaven of 2 Corinthians 12, 2 because of his sin. So he is not some wonderful being, all you New Agers. He is an evil, malignant spirit who sinned against God, who wanted to rise above God and sit on the throne of God, and he couldn't make it. Hmm. So you agree with the first statement that I read on this video, correct? Oh, by Pope Paul, yes. Yes. An expert on demonology and a modern-day scholar is Dr. Merle Unger, and this is what he has to say about Satan. Satan was placed in charge of the earth when this planet was originally created. Again, I did not know this. Dr. A.C. Gaveline adds, Lucifer had a throne, and the throne demands a location. Where was it? The dwelling place of Lucifer in his unfallen condition was the globe on which man dwells now, or the earth. Science has shown that the earth existed once in a different form from what it is now. There was here a gigantic animal creation and a corresponding gigantic vegetation. So here we have a prehistoric earth. Jack, now do you agree with this? These two men are some of the greatest scholars in Christendom, and to hear them say it thrills my heart, for I have preached this. I agree with it totally, and I think I'm going to shock some of you, and we're going to show you how this book fits in with all the statements of scientists today. No problem whatsoever. When this anointed cherub was commissioned by God, in that third heaven, I'm going to be very repetitive to make it clear, of 2 Corinthians 12, 2, God said, you will be the caretaker of the earth I'm going to create. And God created it. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. But something happened. The earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now, God created that earth with perfection in verse 1, when it states, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Why? Because Isaiah 45, 18 says, Yahweh God created not the earth in vain, without form and void. Well, how come then Genesis 1, 2 says that it was without form and void if he didn't create it that way, and that he created it to be inhabited in Isaiah 4, 5, 18? Well, it was inhabited 
in verse 1. Then something happened. Lucifer, as we already mentioned, fell. I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Jesus said in Luke 10, 18, he was there. He was living in the third heaven, but could come to earth to watch over it as the caretaker. It was full of beautiful vegetation, full of animal life. And I believe, along with Dr. Larkin, a prehistoric race before Adam. That's how you account for a million years in the past, two million years in the past, all these prehistoric animals and dinosaurs. They were here. It was a wonderful place. But Lucifer sinned. And so a judgment came, a flood, before Noah's flood of Genesis chapter 6 and 7. How do I know that? Because verse 2 says that the earth was without form and void. But he didn't create it that way. I've already proven from Isaiah 45, 18. But it became that way. No form, no shape. Just nothing. Flooded with darkness. No light. And the Spirit of God brooding on the face of the waters because of a flood. Now, when we get to verse 3, it is not the creation. That took place God knows how many thousands, how many millions of years before. Verse 1. All he does from verse 3 onward is to restore what was originally there. So he says, let there be light. And then the process begins. What an exciting study. One more thing. When judgment day comes, Revelation 20, verse 13 says, The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell, death and Hades delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to his works. Why would God put that text in the Bible concerning judgment day that the sea gives up its dead? Because a few sailors died there? Uh -uh. When that first flood came, everything geographically was changed. That's why there's such beautiful mountains and beautiful vegetation at the bottom of the oceans right now. What was land became ocean. What was ocean and sea became land. And I believe that many of the members of the pre-Adamite race are buried in the depths of the sea down there, seven miles below the waters. And one morning when God says, it's judgment day, the graves on earth give up the dead and all who went down into the sea during that first flood or even during Noah's flood come out to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ, the judge, in John 5.22. But remember, there could be a gap of thousands or billions of years between Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and verse 2. I've just proven it. And we'll thank God for Dr. Gabeline and Dr. Merle Unger and Dr. Larkin for these great things, and for Dr. Walvert, who says verse 3 was just a restoration, a renovation of what was already there. Jack, that is so interesting. In fact, my pastor, I remember even as a little girl, he taught the gap theory, and I found it amazing. I'm sure that you did too just now. Uh, friends, where does Satan dwell right now? I was saying to someone just before we started this tape that we think that he has a pitchfork and he wears a red uniform with horns and he runs around hell jabbing people and torturing people. Uh, where is he right now, Jack? Is he in hell right now or is he here? Rexella, I think I should explain something. He was in the third heaven of 2 Corinthians 12, 2 when he sinned and God cast him out of the place of his dominion. What is the third heaven? I might as well lay down the foundation right now. The first heaven is the atmospheric and stratospheric heaven. And the atmosphere goes up to seven miles, and then from seven to 37 miles, we have the stratosphere. And that's where the cloud formations are. The second heaven is the aerial, stellar, or starry heavens where all of the solar systems are. And then above that, we have the third heaven where God Almighty rules and reigns. Now, Lucifer was 
in the holy mountain of God, the third heaven of 2 Corinthians 12 too, when he was cast out. But he was not cast to the earth. He was cast into heavens one and two. He can approach the end of heaven two to make accusations against believers, Revelation 12.10. Presently, he controls heavens one and two, for he's the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2.2. 2. And he controls the demons who are also in heavens one and two, for he's the prince of the demons, Matthew 12.24. That's why Ephesians 6.12 says, We Christians wrestle not against flesh and blood, against other human beings. If we're wrestling against others, we could win. But we wrestle against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spirit, demonic wickedness in high places. And from heavens to one down to earth, Satan is in control, for he is the God of this world system, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He has not been anywhere near hell. He's not going to go to that place until Christ returns and binds him for a thousand years, Revelation 20, verse 2. He is loose for a short time in verse 7, after the thousand-year reign of Christ. And he deceives, again, multitudes who had loved Jesus during that thousand-year reign, but it shows the power of this enemy of our souls. And finally, in verse 10 of Revelation 20, it says, The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and forever and forever. And shortly after that, as we'll see later, his demons are cast in with him because hell was prepared for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, 41. All right, now let me just get this in my mind before I go on to my next thought here, all right? Here we have Satan who is dwelling on this globe. This was his domain right in the beginning, and he had access to heaven one, two, and three, but because of his sin, God eliminated him out of three, correct? Right. But he still has access. He's roaming around the globe right now. Complete control of heavens one and two, and right. the God of this world system, Second Corinthians 4.4. 4. Yes. All right. In the Old Testament, Satan was primarily the one who accused the righteous, like he did Job. But in the New Testament, he's not only the accuser, but he's also the one who attempts to bring men down, to destroy them. He has the ability to test, to tempt, and to punish people right here on earth. A terrible, terrible uh, being. Now, I have some names that are attributed to Satan in the Bible. You know, I really like to do this with Jack because he's been called the walking Bible, having memorized um, close to 15,000 verses. So I'm going to give a name from the Bible attributed to Satan, and he will give us a verse very, very quickly. The first one, the anointed cherub. Ezekiel 28, 14. Lucifer. Ezekiel 14, 12. Satan. Matthew 4.10. The devil. 1 Peter 5.8. The great dragon. Uh, Revelation 12.7. The old serpent. Revelation 12.9. God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. Prince of the power of the air. Ephesians 2.2. 2. The prince of demons. Uh, Matthew 12.24. The wicked one. 1 John 5.18. Angel of the bottomless pit or the abyss. Revelation 9.11. Angel of the light to deceive the gullible. 2 Corinthians 11.14. The enemy. Uh, Matthew 13, 28. All right, now, friends, this is what he does. Number 14, the destroyer. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 10. The tempter. Uh, Matthew 4, 3. The murderer. John 8, 44. The deceiver. Revelation 12, 9. The liar. Uh, John 8, 44. All right, now, the first sinner. 1 John 3, 8. And the accuser. Revelation 12, 10. And after I read all of that, I am so happy to be able to say, this is not my God. And I am so grateful that I don't have to depend upon on him at all, aren't you? Right up front, I quoted Dr. Bezel, referring to demons, and Jack told us that they are fallen angels. Now, Jack, where did the fallen angels originate? Uh, the same place where their leader got his start when Christ created them. 
John 1, 3 says, All things were made by Christ. Without Christ was not anything made that was made. And then Colossians 1, 16 says, For by Christ were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers, all things created by Christ and for Christ. Those terms, uh, thrones, principalities, powers, etc., have to do with angels and good or bad. That's why when we cast our crowns at Jesus' feet, as I said earlier, we're going to say, Thou art worthy, Jesus, to receive glory, honor, and power, for Thou hast created all things. Revelation 4.11 these demons had their fall when Lucifer led the rebellion. He is the arch demon. And the Bible teaches that he undoubtedly took one third of the angels of heaven with him at his fall. And one can find that in Revelation 12, 4, where his tail will eventually draw a third part of the stars of heaven when he is cast to the earth in that text. But if he has them there, then he's had them since the beginning. One third of them. Were they there in the beginning? Job 38, 7 says, The morning stars sang. The time of creation. Stars? Are angels called stars? Yes. In Revelation 1, 20, it says that the seven angels are the seven stars of the seven churches. And Satan will draw these one-third of the angels in existence with him to earth when he is cast to earth. He's not there yet. Just as the tribulation hour begins in chapter 12 of Revelation, verses 7 to 11. All right, Jack, now here we have Satan, this wonderful chosen angel that God loved so much, and he had great power, and he had dominion of the earth. There were many angels, according to what you believe, I think, now correct me if I'm wrong, angels who followed Satan in their pride. They wanted to be lifted up like Satan wanted to be lifted up. And so they were cast also out of the third heaven. This was their punishment? Right, partially. They were cast out of the third heaven of 2 Corinthians 12, 2. I'm being very repetitive. I want you to get this. It's rich. But they are presently, because of what happened then, and were then, as now, in control of heavens 1 and 2. That's why Satan is called the prince of the power of the air, in Ephesians 2, 2, and the prince of the demons, Matthew 12, 24, who control heavens 1 and 2. And that's why Ephesians 6, 12 says, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, other human beings. We could win if we were. But we're wrestling against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spirit wickedness in high places. But some of the angels were cast down to Tartarus, and their sin was even greater. It could be a sexual experience with the daughters of men in Genesis 6, verse 2. We say, well, angels are sexless, I thought. Well, they are when they are not in an embodied state. As spirits, they're sexless, of course. But when they materialize, they can have sex. Why? Let me prove this. Second Peter 2, 4 says, God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus to be reserved in chains unto darkness. Jude, verse 6 says, And the angels which kept not their first estate, Yahweh God hath reserved in chains under darkness, unto the judgment of the great day. They are chained in darkness, waiting for the great judgment day. And what was their sin? Listen to the next verse, Jude 7. They, the angels, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, going after strange flesh, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So there's something to all of that. Well, they're there now. When the Lord Jesus returns, as I've already said, 
He binds Satan and his evil spirits for 1,000 years in Revelation 20, verse 2. They are released, in verse 7, for their final dastardly deeds upon the earth to turn people against a wonderful Lord Jesus Christ. Can you imagine after a thousand years, mm -hmm. Satan still has power to sway multitudes to turn against the Lord? And the Bible says the number who turn are as the sands of the sea. But then it's over. Verse 10, Satan is cast into the lake of fire. But verses 11 to 15 of Revelation 20, picture the great judgment day. I saw a great white throne in him that sat on it, the Lord Jesus. Now, back to Jude 6, these angels are reserved in darkness unto the judgment of the great day. What is the judgment of the great day? Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15, right after Satan was cast in. Then the myriads the millions upon millions of demonic spirits, his fallen angels, are cast in with him. And that's why Matthew 25, 41 says that hell was originally created for the devil and his angels. However, today, those who want to follow this malignant spirit and spirits will end up in the same place. Mm -hmm. So some of the fallen angels are on earth and in the heavens, and we call them demons. Yes, and others probably committed this sexual sin, and that's why there were giants in the earth in those days. And uh, there's no doubt that it was a sexual thing because of, I repeat, Jude verses 6 and 7. Let me repeat it. The angels which kept not their first estate when they were in heaven with him, but left their own habitation. God hath reserved in chains unto darkness, unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah going after strange flesh are set forth for an example. The angels went after strange flesh as they materialized back there in Genesis 6. And you know they can materialize if you'll study Genesis chapters 18 and 19. Good explanations, Jack. Very, very good. But there's a lot to controversy about this. Are the fallen angels, could you give me a little bit more evidence, are the fallen angels what we call demons who are now roaming the earth and in heaven one and two? Uh, let me clarify something first, Rexella. There are two Greek words, and the New Testament was written in Greek. And the one is diabolus, meaning devil. And the other is demonia, meaning demons. Now, you can never find the word demons in the New Testament. You always find devils. But that is not a correct translation because there is only one diabolus, devil, but there are many demonia, and demonia should have been translated demons. So every time you come across the term devils, plural, change it to demons. All right. Now, are these fallen angels, the demons, mentioned so often in the Word of God? 55 different times, just as that term, devils, which I said should be demons. Let's see. First of all, Lucifer of Isaiah 14, 12 was the anointed cherub, the anointed angel that served God in Ezekiel 28, 14. And since he is the prince of the demons, Matthew 12, 24, wouldn't it be natural to teach that if the head angel became the devil, that all of the fallen angels became the demonia or demons. And that's what I believe. Secondly, we read that these angels are going to be judged. 2 Peter 2, 4, Jude, verse 6. And when is this going to happen? When Christ returns? And guess what? 1 Corinthians 6, 3 says, Know you not that we, the church of Jesus Christ, shall judge angels. Certainly, they're not the good ones. They're the bad ones, fallen angels. And then they go into a place called hell, Gehenna. And it's reserved for the devil and his angels, Matthew 25, 41. Now, if they are not the fallen angels, then there is no judgment for demons because never once can you find demons being judged or cast into the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Therefore, they must be these fallen angels who became the demonia 
of the Greek New Testament. Again, not devils, but demons. That's so important to get that straight. Thirdly, just before Christ is about to return to earth, there is a war raging in the heavenlies described in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 12. And it says, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels, good ones, fought against the dragon, Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought against Michael and prevailed not. Neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And they were cast out to the earth, the devil and his angels. Folks, these are demonic spirits described in Ephesians 6.12 as spirit wickedness in high places who are helping Lucifer, the dragon, the serpent, Satan, Beelzebub, there's so many names, fight against Michael and his good angels. And then, of course, they're cast out of heavens one and two at that time. Not until then, just before Christ is to return. And they spend the last 42 months of their reign before they are bound for the thousand years of Revelation 20, verse 2, doing everything they can to destroy mankind. Because verse 12 of Revelation 12 says, Rejoice, ye heavens! Why? They've been cast out of heaven 1 and 2. And goes on to say, Woe! Woe! Unto the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, because the devil is come down to you, and his angels on terra firma, the ground, the earth. And he has great wrath because he knows that he has but a short time, 42 more months before Jesus comes and binds him for the thousand years of Revelation 20, verse 2, so that Christ can reign for that glorious millennium in verse 4, unencumbered with satanic influence. Jake, and it sounds like we're in a battle. <laughs> oh. Good and bad. Put and on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Ephesians yes. 6, 11. Right. So we have both of these forces all around us all the time. Well, there's some wonderful, wonderful names attributed to God and God alone. He is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent. In other words, he's all-knowing, all-powerful, and he's everywhere all the time. Now, do these names apply to Satan also? Uh, does, it, does he have all knowledge, and is he all-powerful, and is he everywhere all the time, Jack? And if not, how does he do a global work? Oh, he's a limited being, Rexella. And as I said, you can find the terminology devils, which should be demons, 55 times in the Bible, but eight times you can find the terminology thrones, principalities, powers, spirit wickedness in high places. And you find it, of course, in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, Ephesians 3.10, Ephesians 6.12, Colossians 1.16, Colossians 2.10, Colossians 2.15, and Titus 3.1. Eight times. Study it when you have a chance. But do you know that since Satan is limited in his power, he is not God. There's only one all-powerful God, and his name is Yahweh. And of course, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working in unison. But Satan, because he is limited, has to have an order, just like an army of beings to carry out his program. And he has five-star generals and then lesser generals, lieutenants, captains, down to corporals, and finally millions and millions of buck privates to do the job. What? Remember those eight verses I just gave you? Some were good angels, others bad. But there's an order here. And Ephesians 6.12 really describes it. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, 
against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spirit wickedness in high places. You listening? Because this is going to clarify a lot of things for you. The principalities there, and this is from the Greek, are the five star generals who lead Lucifer's forces so that they can relay messages to him using the next group, the powers. And they are the lesser generals, lieutenants, captains, down to the corporals. And then there is the term spirit wickedness in high places consisting of millions, millions, and millions of these fallen angels. And through this network, Satan is able to operate. But there's a special term in that text that will overwhelm you. And it states, the rulers of the darkness of this world. They control this world system. Now we have good angels controlling good rulers. But we have these fallen demonic spirits often controlling corrupt government officials. And it says this special group of spirits create all of this bribery, corruption, graft among officials because they work on the rulers of the darkness of this world system. Really? Let me prove that. Go back to Daniel chapter 10, verses 20 and 21. Remember the story? Daniel's been in prayer, but nothing happens for 21 days. And finally, Gabriel, who delivers the messages in the Bible, says, Daniel, the reason that your prayers were hindered for 21 days, why you received no answer is that there was a battle going on in the heavenlies. And Michael came to my aid. He's the warrior, just the one in Revelation 12, verses 7 and 11, who's going to fight the dragon just before Satan takes over the earth for 42 months and incarnates this one called the Antichrist. And he said, Michael is battling right now the prince of Persia. Well, Persia is the name for modern-day Iran and Iraq. Was that prince, that demonic spirit, on earth battling? No. The battle was going on in the heavenlies, but angels are called princes, Ephesians 2.2. 2. And this angelic being, fallen one, demonic spirit, in high places, was controlling this ruler of Persia from the heavenlies. And he says, and the prince of Grecia shall come. Another spirit that would control the leader of Greece at that time. For these spirits control the rulers of the darkness of this world. But the point I want to emphasize once again is there is an order of angels because the devil is not omniscient, all-knowing, is not omnipresent everywhere and is not omnipotent, all-powerful. So he has his five-star generals right down to buck privates by the millions, tens of millions, relaying the messages back and forth. And this is interesting stuff. All right, Jack, according to what you've said, Satan, the demons, have really controlled governments down through history, and I would say that they continue to do this because of so much that's going on around the world right now. It seems to me there have to be an awful lot of them to do this because things happen simultaneously. Do you have any idea how many there are? They control the Adolf Hitlers, the Joseph Stalins, the Benito Mussolinis, and millions of people who are engulfed in iniquity. They're wicked spirits. In part one of this video series, we dealt with these elect angels of 1 Timothy 5.21, good, holy angels, and said that there were millions of them because Hebrews 12.22 says that they form an innumerable company you cannot begin to count them. They're so vast in number. But 
when we get to Revelation 5.11, and that was one of the thrilling things in video one, we see a heavenly choir. And it says the number was 10,000 times 10,000, plus thousands of thousands. And they estimate that this could be somewhere around 250 million angels. Take every human being in America, combine them in one of the great choirs on earth, and you have a picture of this angelic host singing. And listen to what they're singing. Next verse. Worthy is the Lamb, the Lord Jesus. I love it. But let's look at the other side. The Bible teaches that there's an unlimited amount of fallen angels. And since we know from Revelation 12, 4, that Satan has one-third of the angels with him, we know that there must be way over 100 million just from that, because there were 200 to 250 million in that choir of Revelation 5.11. And here is the proof. In Mark chapter 5, we have the story of the Gadarene demoniac who was running among the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. And he was a raving lunatic. And when Jesus approached him, he said, What is your name? And the demonic spirit used the vocal cords of this human and said, My name is Legion, for we are many. A legion in the Roman army totaled 6,000 soldiers. 6,000 malignant spirits in one man. No wonder they couldn't tame him. But I just saw this, Rexella. You know, we talk about this great war that's going to happen before Armageddon. And Revelation 9.16 says the number of the army was 200,000 thousand. That's 200 million. But what I saw for the first time, and I just had not put it together, is that in that ninth chapter of the book of Revelation, verses 1 to 6, these malignant spirits are released from the bottomless pit to possess the world's most ferocious army just before Armageddon. So we know we've got at least 200 million fallen angels. Mm. Thank you. Mm. Terrible. I have to stop right here, friends, and just say, you don't have to give in to all these demons around Rexel. you. We don't have to have that in our lives. I'll tell you, I've got some wonderful news. Oh, I should say. This thrilled me. You know, you study these things all your life, and then suddenly the Holy Spirit brings it all together. All these verses I've memorized. Now remember, we've already shown you that principalities, powers, have to do with these spirits. Listen to Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. Paul's talking about the security of a Christian. Oh, Rexa, this is so precious. I'm going to take it slowly. I'm going to dissect this. Paul says, For I am persuaded, convinced, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Yes, it is. He named those very things, these fallen angels and the principalities and powers, the spirit wickedness in high places, and says, none of it, none of it can ever separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Stay close to the Lord. You have safety in Him. Jack, that is one of the most powerful verses in all the Bible. Did you ever stop to think about it? Any of these fallen angels or principalities or powers or any other creature, 
even creatures we don't even know about cannot keep <laughs> oh, us from the love of God. Wonderful. I love it. I love it. I do too. <laughs> Thanks for giving it to us, Jack. Dr. Merle Unger also stated something that is very thought-provoking. Demons have superhuman intelligence. They have power over human bodies. Now, let me just stop here for just one moment. I have just gotten over a cold. Not all physical ailments are because of demon possession or demon influence. Nothing to do with demons. I just had a cold and I got over it. Not all mental illness is because of demon possession. In fact, depression is thought to be caused by a reduction in a chemical. In other words, it's a neurochemical imbalance. If you go to the uh, the doctor, he will give you a chemical that will help you with this depression. Mm -hmm. Not all physical <coughs> illness, not all mental illness is because of demons. Now, you agree with this, don't you, Jack? Oh, I really do, Rexella. You know, some preachers see a demon under every rock and every sniffle, every bit of illness means that a demon is in control of this person. And folks get frustrated thinking that perhaps they're in league with the demonia, the fallen angels. Now, listen to me. Whenever a man says that every sickness is of the devil, then there is a problem with his theology. Why? Because Hebrews 9.27 says, it is appointed unto men once to die. Every one of us must die, and I got news for you. If you're not involved in an accident, you're going to die through a sickness, and if that is a demon, then all of us will die demon-possessed, and there's no hope. So let's forget that theory. It just is not what the Bible teaches. Jesus said there's some sicknesses that are for the glory of God. In John chapter 11, as Jesus approaches the city, Mary and Martha come running to him and they're in tears. Oh, our brother was sick and died. And Jesus said, chapter 11, verse 4, this is for the glory of God. I'm going to raise him from the dead, and all will marvel when they know what power I have and who I really am. And when trials and tests come, it's not some demon. It's that God wants you to be built up in the faith. And if you can say when these things happen, all things work together for good to them that love God, Romans 8.28, there will be a special reward for you. God only has five crowns that he'll distribute for his people to lay at the throne in Revelation 4.10 in front of Jesus at his feet. How do you get one of the crown? James 1.12. Blessed is the man or woman who endures testing and trials. For when he or she is tried, he or she will receive a crown of life. Again, to lay at Jesus' feet. Now, there are people who fall far from God. They loved Him at one time, and then they fall into sin, the depths of depravity. They know better. In the Corinthian church, in 1 Corinthians 5, 1, we find a young man involved in one of the most horrible of sins. Paul says, It is reported that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not even heard among the Gentiles that a man should have his father's wife. Here was a young man living in an incestuous relationship with his stepmother, the father's new wife. And Paul says in verse 5, Pray for the destruction of his flesh. Pray that some calamity might come upon him so that he'll open his eyes to see the depravity into which he has fallen and get his heart right with God. Listen to him. Pray for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus, when the Lord Jesus calls him home, either through death or the rapture. So that we have that. Now, let's look at the other side. Well, yes, Jack. I mean, some people have given, given themselves over, certainly, to satanic influence. I mean, I'm thinking about Hitler and some of the terrible things that have gone on in governments. Uh, terrible Plus things. millions and millions of people. Oh, sure. yes, millions. And how can somebody murder uh, a group of people and cut off their heads and so many other yeah. things? Uh, to me, this They cannot... call it temper against anti. It is demon possession. I'm convinced of it. 
right. Yeah. Well, so some people do give themselves right. over to this. Well, you know, Dr. Unger stated this. They have power over human bodies to cause some of the things I'm going to mention right now because they've been mentioned in the Bible. Jack, you tell us where they're mentioned in the Bible, uh -huh. will you? First of all, they can cause mental incoherence. That's in uh, Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 and 33. And they can cause insanity. Oh, read Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20. You know, when you read about these people, let's repeat it, Rick Sella, who kill others and then behead them. We've lived in such a day of savagery. We've never seen anything like it. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, I was temporarily insane. No, you were controlled by a wicked, malicious, malignant, demonic, evil spirit, friend. Yes, and also suicidal mania. Yeah, that's found over in Mark chapter 9, verse 22. The young man often cast himself into the waters or into the fire yeah. to try to drown himself or to try to burn himself to death. Again, now we must say not all suicides are because no. of that. No, no, no. But it can be an influence right. of a demon Even at times. Samson, the great hero of the faith, listed in Hebrews 11th chapter, committed suicide. Yes, yeah. he, and he was a hero of the faith. <clears throat> so we have to differentiate, distinguish what's what. Absolutely. Or it can, a demon could make you cause personal injury to yourself other than um, suicidal tendencies, yeah. Jack. And that's Mark 9, verse 18. And of course, when you get to 22, it's what I just said. The young man is inflicting injury upon himself. He's throwing himself into the water, throwing himself into the fire. Normal people don't do that. There has to be some kind of influence that directs him in that channel. All right, again, Dr. Unger says this. If good angels can comfort and otherwise influence the minds of God's people, and if the Holy Spirit can enter and take possession, thank God for that, the Holy Spirit can enter your life and take possession and influence for good those who choose the way of salvation, then what valid objection may be offered as to why Satan and demons, as the Bible teaches, may not also enter into the bodies and take possession of the minds of those who willingly yield themselves as slaves to do evil things. This is a question that unbelief must answer and which no candid philosopher or scientist who does research in psychology can reasonably ignore. You cannot ignore this, friends. It is in the Bible that they do have influence. If you give yourselves over to this, they can influence your mind and also mm. influence your body. Rick Sullivan, Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20, gives a full detailed story of the Gadarene who was possessed with demons. And verses 3 to 9 give us the marks of possession. Watch this carefully. First of all, the Gadarene demoniac had supernatural strength. They bound him with fetters and chains and he snapped them like pretzels. Secondly, he was a raving lunatic. It says that he ran up and down among the tombs in that graveyard, crying and cutting himself with stones, and he pulled off his clothes. Nudity often goes along with demon possession, friend, whether it's the Riviera or anywhere else. And no man could tame him. Thirdly, he was schizophrenic, a dual personality. First, he runs to worship Jesus, and then he cries out, I abjure thee. And the word abjure, look it up in the dictionary, is I renounce you. He said one thing, and then did the opposite. Fourthly, he resisted spiritual help. He said, I abjure thee that you torment me not. I renounce you. Leave me alone. Fifthly, he had psychic ability. Watch out for these psychics. Oftentimes, they're just perpetrators of fraud, putting on a good show, or they are connected with the spirit world. He said, I know you, you're Jesus. How do you know that? Psychic ability. Finally, we find that a demon controlled his voice. Demons often speak through people. And Jesus said, what is your name? The demon answered, my name is Legion. The Legion of the Roman army was 6,000. 
Legion, for we are many. But you know what? I always want to bring good news. Jesus touched him. Jesus healed him. And by the time we hit verse 15, he's sitting at the foot of Jesus clothed. That's important. When you meet Jesus, you'll get your clothes on. And he was in his right mind. Jesus performed the greatest exorcism ever on that memorable day. Ooh, that's the power of the Lord. And uh, I have an important question, maybe going through your mind now. If a person accepts Jesus as his or her Savior and his spirit comes into their life, the Holy Spirit comes in to dwell within that person, can that person ever be demon-possessed? If you are a born-again child of God, demons can influence you. You can become obsessed and many other things. So oppressed, but you cannot be possessed. You say, why? Because of the Holy Spirit. John 3, 5 says, Except a man be born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Romans 8, 9 says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of Christ. When one becomes a born-again Christian, the Holy Spirit comes into that person. That's why 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? 1 Corinthians 6.19, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you? You've got that blessed Holy Spirit in you. You can't have that spirit and an evil spirit. So, 1 John 4.4 4 says, Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, you cannot be possessed. Now, you can be influenced. That spirit can deal with your mind and make you think on all these things to do that are wicked because these wicked spirits in high places are influencing you, but you cannot be possessed. But the victory comes through the Word of God. Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, 11, You are clean through the Word, John 15, 3. Stay in the Word. And as you do, the Holy Spirit who wrote this book will fill you to overflowing. And He who's in you won't allow these malignant spirits to affect you in any way. Jack, will Satan and his demons be more active as they know that the time of the Lord's return is near because they know their time is short here oh. on earth? First Timothy 4, 1 says, The Holy Spirit speaks expressly, plainly, that in the, there it is, Rexel, latter times some shall depart from the faith, the Christian faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. You've got the ministering spirits, the good ones, who minister to believers. Hebrews 1.14, you have these seducing spirits here. And they will increase their activities, it says right here, in the latter days. It's so bad during the tribulation hour that Revelation 9.20 says, Neither repented they of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils, these demons. They've actually gone to the worship of these fallen angels. And we quoted earlier, let me give it to you again. Revelation 12, verses 7 to 12. There was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought against Michael and prevailed not. And they were cast out of heaven, one and two, as we said before. Where? To the earth. Now watch verse 12. It says, Rejoice, you heavens. Why? Because you've been cleansed of all of these malignant spirits who've been there for the centuries. But since they've gone to earth, the warning continues. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and even the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, the earth, having great wrath, because he knows he has but a short time. That's when all hell breaks loose. That is why it's called the Great Tribulation. Revelation 7, 14. He knows he has 42 months left to perform his dastardly deeds before Mashiach, Messiah, Christus, Christ comes back. 
to set up his glorious kingdom. And he is bound for the thousand years with his hosts of evil spirits, Revelation 20, verse 2. So yes, it's going to increase. You know, Jack, I don't find it so hard to believe that people will worship demons because they think that uh, Satan is something wonderful. In fact, I read uh, right up front on this uh, uh, tape for you that that's the way they believe. He's an, a wonderful person. I'll tell you, Rexella, people don't understand who he really is and how he can make himself appear as an angel of light. And that's why New Agers are so enamored with this Lucifer. And we have this Jay-Z Knight who has a 35,000-year-old spirit rant the speaking through her. And New Agers fall for all of this because it all seems so innocent, so wonderful, so beautiful. But let me tell you why. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 to 15, is commenting about false preachers who are propagating air, and said, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Come on, can they go that far? He says, don't marvel, don't be shocked. Even Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers transform themselves into the ministers of righteousness, whose end, judgment day, shall be according to their works. But his ministers, and that can not only be the fallen spirits, evil, malignant spirits, but those controlled by them who propagate these false teachings, beware of where you get your information. Get it from the book, not from Benjamin Cream and his Lucifer who came from the planet Venus centuries ago. That is malarkey. All right. <laughs> well, speaking about religion, and you said, you know, that uh, they, they, they set themselves up as, as a religion, really, Jack. What do you think the demons and Satan are going to try to do in these last days as far as the religious scene is concerned? God just gave this to me two months ago. And I've had bits and pieces I proclaimed before, but this is it, thoroughly considered. The Bible teaches that there are good and bad angels. The elect angels, 1 Timothy 5, 21, are the good ones. The other are Satan's angels, Matthew 25, 41. Now, the good angels are ministering spirits to believers, Hebrews 1, 14. The fallen angels are seducing spirits, proclaiming doctrines of demons, 1 Timothy 4, 1. 1 John 4, 6 says that there is the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The spirit of truth is proclaimed by these ministering spirits who are the good angels. The spirit of error is proclaimed by these seducing spirits proclaiming these doctrines of demons. Now, we are told to beware. In 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, he says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try, test the spirits to see whether they're of God. How does one know? Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Isn't that plain? Mm. Now, what are they confessing if they're good angels? And what are they confessing if they're evil spirits? The good ones are saying Jesus is Christ. The bad ones, Jesus is not Christ. What does that mean? Matthew 1, 21 says, His name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Someone says, well, I believe Jesus was born. I believe he died. I believe he rose again. That doesn't mean anything. The demons believe that much and tremble, James 2, 19. That is just a mental assent to some facts. And so somebody can say, yeah, I believe Jesus was born almost 2,000 years ago. That's not what this text is saying. Now listen to what it is saying. If one denies that Jesus is Christ, it's Antichrist. But if he says, yes, Jesus is Christ, 
those are the good angels bringing the truth to that individual's mind. That Jesus is Christ, all right? Jesus is his human name. That's not important. That's the name Yeshua, Joshua. And there are millions in the world who have had that name, especially in South America. The next name is the important one, Christ. In the Hebrew language, it's Mashiach, translated Messiah in English, translated Christus in Greek, translated Christ in English. It's all the same thing. And Mashiach or Christus or Christ means the anointed one and the sent one. Now we get into great theology. There are cults today who teach that Jesus started his existence when he came to Bethlehem. Now, if that's all you believe, that's the spirit of Antichrist. But if you believe he's the sent one, then you believe he was from all eternity, from old, from everlasting, Micah 5, 2. You believe that he is part of that Elohim, Genesis 1, 1, created the world. You believe he is that son of God of Proverbs 30, verse 4, mentioned centuries before he's to come into the world through the Virgin Mary. You believe that he's God. You see, he always existed. And Galatians 4, 4 says, when the fullness of the time was come, God, every word is important now, sent forth his son not created a son, sent forth his son. If he sent him, he always was God from all eternity, the second member of the Trinity. And that's what happened when he came through the womb of the Virgin Mary. So what this text is saying is, if you believe that this Jesus is the sent one, is God from all eternity, the second member of the Trinity, then you've been taught by a ministering spirit one of the elect angels. But if you deny this, like three major cults do in the world today, that this Jesus is God from all eternity, then you have been taught by these seducing spirits, a doctrine of demons that does away with the deity of Christ. Now, does this Bible teach Jesus is God? Oh. Matthew 1, 23, Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is, I love it, God with us. You can't mistake that, can you? In John 1, 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Who's the Word? Verse 14, The Word became flesh. Who of the Trinity became flesh? Christ at his incarnation. So let's go back and substitute the word Christ for word. In the beginning was Christ. And Christ was with God, and Christ was God. Not only that, Romans 9, 5 says, Christ came who is over all, God, blessed forever. 1 Timothy 3, 16, great is the mystery of godliness that God was manifest in the flesh. Titus 2, 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The Father is speaking to His Son in Hebrews 1, 8 and says, Yahweh, the Father, to Jesus, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. You know, if the Father calls His Son God, maybe some of you followers of Jehovah ought to do the same thing. And 1 John 5, 20 says, We have believed in Christ. This is the true God. If you don't believe that, you have been listening to a malignant seducing spirit proclaiming a doctrine of demons believe god mm, that's very powerful jack very very good do you remember when god put adam and eve in the garden of eden and he said don't eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil if you do you're going to to die well satan came to eve and he gave her a half truth in genesis 3 he said, you're not going to die, you're going to be like gods. Did you ever notice, friends, that so often cults get started by giving half-truths, just enough to pull people in saying, mm, that really sounds good. That surely is from the Bible. I remember that in the Bible. And they're drawn into a system and into a cult because of a half truth, just like Satan did with Eve. She was fooled. You know, Jack, I think that so often people are drawn in because of the, the way that 
uh, the religion is altered, just a half-truth, don't you? Mm, very definitely, Rexella. And repetition is such a great teacher, I want to quote it again. 1 Timothy 4.1 The Holy Spirit speaks expressly, plainly, that in the latter times, that's now, many shall depart from the Christian faith, giving heed to these seducing spirits, fallen angels, and they'll be proclaiming the doctrine of demons. Now, when Paul mentions an angel in Galatians 1.8, he has to be talking about a fallen angel because a good angel wouldn't try to divert one from the truth. And he says this, Though we are an angel from heaven, and they are in heavens 1 and 2, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let them be accursed. Anathema. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. But he started out with saying, if an angel brought another gospel, what is the gospel, Paul? 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, that Christ died for his sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And when he died, he shed his blood. When an angel fallen brings a message that Christ is not God, we just handle that, it is a doctrine of demons. When he secondly denies that it is the shedding of blood that is necessary for the remission of sins, it is a doctrine of demons. Because this book says in the Old Testament, Leviticus 17, 11, it's the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. New Testament, Hebrews 9, 22, without shedding of blood is no remission of sins. Rexel, you mentioned Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. God put them in the garden under the test of obedience and said in Genesis 2, 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. The old serpent comes along in Genesis 3, 4 and says, ah, you won't die. Go ahead and eat. Verse 6, she partook and ate, gave unto her husband, he did eat. Verse 7, the eyes of them both were open, then they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together. But you know, fig leaves dry up, and they're not a proper covering physically or spiritually. So now what? God appears in the garden, and in chapter 3, verse 21, says, Unto Adam and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. Now, in taking those skins, the blood was shed. Without shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Adam and Eve taught this lesson to their two sons. And I'm going to prove all this. So in chapter 4, after Cain was taught that it's the blood that makes an atonement for the soul, he brings an offering to God of dry vegetables. And Abel brings one of his lambs. And God is pleased with Abel but very dissatisfied with Cain. And Cain slew his brother, killed him. Genesis 4, 8. Listen carefully. Why was God displeased with Cain? How was he to know? All right? Hebrews 11, 4 answers it. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent, a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain. An animal? that contained blood for sacrifice? Yes. By faith he did it. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing. Where did he hear it? His parents. When God clothed them with the skins of animals and the blood was shed. Abel believed. His brother didn't. If God isn't satisfied with my vegetable offering, he can lump it. Well, God lumped it. But now here is the clincher. All right? John 8, 44 says that Satan, the devil, was a murderer from the beginning. Try to find a place where Satan murdered someone in the beginning. The first murder was when Cain slew his brother Abel, I repeat, in Genesis 4, 8. But it was this malignant spirit behind the murder as in most murders today. Instead of all this baloney of temporary insanity, it's demon possession, and these people ought to pay for their crimes. But the denial of Christ as God, the denial of the blood atonement, 
and the denial of the Word of God is a doctrine of demons, or doctrines of demons, if you prefer. And that's why when we come to the last book of the Bible, Revelation, the last chapter 22, almost the last few verses, 18 and 19, says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the book of this prophecy. If any man shall add to these things, God shall add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Be careful which spirit controls you. When it's the right spirit, you will believe that Christ is God, believe that the blood atonement is the only way of salvation, and believe that this book is without error, regardless of what some evil-spirited, controlled clergyman might say. Okay, now Jack, I want to back up just a second here. You said a moment ago that every murderer should pay for that. And it, it is true to pay their debt to society. But let me ask you this. A murderer, somebody who's on drugs, someone who's in, in, in so entrenched in something that we can't even imagine, they can be forgiven with this, can't they? Oh, have power over definitely. it. Definitely. That's because we have a wonderful Savior. He didn't die for his own sin. 1 Peter 2.22 said he did no sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he knew no sin. But it was for us, sinners, like Jack Van Ippie, like you. And that's why 1 Corinthians 15.3 says Christ died for our sin. 1 Peter 2.24, who his own self bear our sin in his own body on the tree, and that's Calvary. Revelation 1, 5, under Christ who loved us and washed us from our sin in his own blood. And when one studies 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11, verse 9 says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, then names ten groups of sinners who won't make it if they stay in those sins, but if they come to Christ, he will forgive them, and does, because they apparently did, for verse 11 says, And such were some of you, but you are washed. I don't care what you've done. Mm. There's hope today. Because 1 John 1, 7 says, The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanseth us from all, all sin. I love it. Jack, I had to put that in because, you know, some people who've been watching our television program are on death row. And they wrote us a letter just recently and said, You know what? I'm no longer afraid to die because I've been forgiven. I think that's absolutely wonderful. And remember, Saul of Tarsus murdered thousands of Christians on the Damascus Turnpike, but found the Lord Jesus in Acts chapter 9 when the great light from heaven appeared. And not only did God forgive him, but he allowed him to become the Apostle Paul and write 14 books of the New Testament. Now that's love. Right about now, I think we need to say thank the Lord for his great power. Phil Phillips states this, Those who claim to have frequent conversations and contact with their personal angels nearly always come to this point after years of personally exploring the metaphysical realm. Encounters with spirit guides and Indian medicine men or Tibetan monks turning themselves into the energies of the Great Mother, studying ancient Egyptian gods and focusing on the energy myriads of the earth and so forth. They claim angels speak to them with specific directions and use their own vocal cords to speak. The New Age religion is a revival of the religion of ancient Babylon in which mystery cults, sorcery, and occultism and immorality flourished. They believed in what I'm going to say right now. They believed in the man as God doctrine, occult visualizations, sexual licentiousness, and that is freedom from any moral restraint, and psychic mind powers, reincarnation, the evolution theory, the goddess worship, and we really have a lot of this now, karma, fire worship, self-love, numerology, necromancy, and levitation. They believed in all of these things. Now, is, are these things the doctrine of demons, Jack? Yes, and it's the New Age philosophy. Beware of it, folks. Beware of it. If you go into a 
normal bookstore now and look for religious titles, you'll hardly find any. Go to the New Age shelves. You'll be overwhelmed. They've taken over. Why? Because we're living in the last days, and especially that first point you mentioned about the God-man theory. Yes. They're running around saying they're little gods. Now, this is why we believe we're living in the last times. Not the end of the world. We don't believe that. The last times, the latter days, before Jesus comes to set up his kingdom for a thousand years. You see, just before Christ returns to earth, there is an Antichrist who comes to power in Revelation 13, 1. But he claims to be God. Now, everything is being set up for him right now as all these New Agers call themselves little gods. When he comes, he'll say, I am the God of gods. So, he's situated in a temple in the Middle East, and 2 Thessalonians 2, 4 says that he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And Daniel 11, 36 says that he magnifies himself above every God. Well, how many gods are there? Millions upon millions, because the New Agers are claiming to be deities. When did they claim it? Even Shirley MacLaine, in a movie on television, when she was standing on Malibu Beach, continually cried out, I am God, I am God, I am. That is the expression that relates them to the deity, I am. You're hearing it constantly. Now, how can I prove this? In Exodus, the third chapter, God tells Moses to go and be a minister to his people. And he says, but whom shall I say sent me? What is his name? What is your name, God? And in Exodus 3, 14, the father says, tell him, I am that I am hath sent you. Now, I've heard Benjamin Cream and New Agers say that nowhere did Christ ever claim to be God. Are you listening? I could give many texts, but I'm going to give you one. It's John chapter 8, verses 56 to 58. And Jesus said to the people of his day, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the people unto him, You're not yet 50 years old, and you've seen our father Abraham. Abraham, at that point, had lived 2,193 years ago. And Jesus said, Your father Abraham saw me. When? When he was the God of all eternity. And then he says, I'll tell you when he saw me. Next verse. I am that I am. The I am of Exodus 3.14, my father speaking, includes me, the I am, of today, in their era of time, because he was the second member of the Trinity and could say in John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. So Yahweh the Father called himself, I am that I am. Jesus in John 8, verses 56 to 58, called himself the I am that I am. Now watch it in Mark 13, 6. When the disciples said, Jesus, when are you going to return to earth? He answered, oh, this is startling. Many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. The Greek word there is polis, where we have many, meaning millions upon millions will come in my name saying. Now watch it. If you look at that text, Christ is in italics. And whenever you see that in the Bible, it means it's not in the original Greek. It was put there to help people understand the scriptures better. Now, let me quote it exactly as it is in the Greek. When are you coming back, Jesus? When millions are crying out, I am, I am, my name. That's it. I don't think we've had an I am cult in centuries until the last few decades. As the New Age world cries out, I am, I am, I am that I am. When you're coming, Jesus, when millions come in my name, what name? Saying, I am. Then I'll return. Wow.
very powerful, Jack. I'd like to quote Dr. Merle Unger once again. The popularity of the occult is bringing more participants out into the open. Major colleges and universities are offering courses and degrees in the occult and witchcraft. Occult stars are played up on television interview programs, and occult publishing firms are putting out thousands of books. The occult has become respectable, now listen to this, by renaming demonic practices. Today, fortune tellers are called futurists. Demon possession is politely termed channeling. Crystal charms have replaced crystal balls, and yoga meditation has become an acceptable form of self-hypnosis. Now, I do have a couple of questions for Jack. The first being this, uh, the Bible tells us what the future holds. It also gives us a form of ethics that we should practice if we are going to be called Christians or, or if we want to be good people. It, it just tells us how we should live, the Ten Commandments. But what does the Bible say about occultic practices and does God want us to know the future outside of what he's already told us in the Bible? Does he want us to go to fortune tellers? I want you to listen carefully, folks, as I speak from my heart. I'm going to go slowly because this is so important to your eternal existence. Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 to 12 state, There shall not be found among you anyone that useth divination, meaning fortune-telling, or one who observes times, meaning using astrological charts and horoscopes, or an enchanter, meaning a demonic-controlled magician as opposed to the hand is quicker than the eye entertainer or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, meaning mediums possessed with a spirit or guide, even under the guise of religion, or a wizard, meaning a clairvoyant or psychic, or a necromancer, meaning a medium who consults with the dead. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Leviticus 19.26 warns, You shall not use enchantment nor observe times, so away with astrological charts and horoscopes. Obey God. Also, regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards, meaning clairvoyants and psychics, to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God, verse 31. Friends, dealing with the spirit world and purchasing all the garbage sold in the occult stores can only bring one into league with the devil and his vile, malicious spirits who delight in wreaking havoc and misery in one's life. Heed the admonition of the prophet Isaiah, who said, And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God? Isaiah 8, 19. The answer for all Christians and unbelievers alike is to turn to the Almighty, not demon-controlled humans. Oh, the reason I'm speaking out so boldly is that the world in which we live is full of Satan's victims who innocently started out with an Ouija board, which spell out weird words and frightening messages. Demon influence found its beginning with this seemingly harmless fascination but now holds these individuals in its terrifying grasp. Additional millions are tapping with their precious God-given minds for the use of drugs and oriental meditation cults. Little do they realize that they're exposing themselves to demons who will give them a false peace through calm, easy, light-hearted feelings and new religious experiences. What these individuals do not know is that Satan, the arch demon and devil, is the god of this world, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, and he's able to appear as an angel of light and give one the greatest religious goose-pimpled feeling he has ever experienced. However, it is but the religion of fallen angels catering only to the flesh. Don't depend on feelings which demons produce. Rely strictly on God's program of faith, for without faith it is impossible to please Him. Hebrews 11.6. Jack, I received a letter from a girl who had been fooling around with a Ouija board. It told her to commit murder. 
oh, it's so dangerous. You know, I wrote back right away, get rid of that. Don't have anything to do with anything like that. So God says a lot about these things in the Bible. Right. I was amazed. Yeah, he mm. really does. All right. Now, when will the reign of Satan and all these demons end? You know, I was saying to one of our camera uh, persons here, I said, you know, actually, Dave, one day Satan's going to end up in hell. He said, good, that's where he belongs. And it certainly is where he belongs. When is he going to get there, Jack? We're living in the last times, 1 Timothy 4, 1. The Bible teaches that there is going to be that war in heaven, as we've already mentioned a number of times in this video study. And it's found in Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 to 12, where Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, Satan, and Satan and his angels fought against Michael and prevailed not. And these malignant evil spirits are cast out of heavens one and two. They have been in control of these two heavens for centuries. But now it's going to come to an end. And this seven-year period of tribulation is going on, and 42 months of it has transpired under Antichrist. And now this battle occurs when they are cast to the earth and Revelation 12, 12, and says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath. Because he knows that he has but a short time. So here is Satan and his angels now in control of earth for the final 42 months of the tribulation hour. Revelation 11, 3, and Revelation 12, 6 mentions 1260 days there and that's the Jewish calendar 360 days a year so we're talking 42 months three and a half years and all hell breaks loose on earth there are 21 judgments occurring half of the population of the earth dies he has great wrath because he knows his time is short but now it's ending as Jesus Christ appears and as the Lord comes to set up his kingdom upon earth we find that the first thing he does in Revelation 20, verse 2, is bind Satan for the 1,000 years. And then he rules this world with great tranquility and peace. It's going to be a wonderful time for this great millennium in history. But after the 1,000 years, Satan is loosed for a brief season in that 20th chapter, verse 7. And he's able to convince millions upon millions that Christ is not what he said he was. Can you imagine? After being in the presence of the Lord for 10 centuries? And the Bible teaches in verses 8 and 9 that a multitude like the sand of the sea follows Satan. Well, the thousand years ends and God deals with this malignant spirit. At that point in time, this time of rebellion is very brief. And then Jesus Christ does something. Verse 10. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and forever. Now, in 2 Peter 2, 4 and Jude verse 6, we had, as we said earlier in the study, these angels who are in Tartarus where they're in chains and they're bound, get the wording, unto the judgment of the great day. When is the judgment of the great day? The next verse, Revelation 20, verse 11. Satan has just been cast into the lake of fire. Now the judgment begins. Who's going to judge these angels? Believers. Know you not that we shall judge angels? 1 Corinthians 6, 3. They're judged and they are placed with the old devil, Satan, Beelzebub, Lucifer, call him what you will. How do I know that? Because Matthew 25, 41 says that this hell, this final Gehenna, this last penitentiary was created for the devil and his angels. And now it's over forever and forever. The holy city that was hovering above the earth 
during the 1,000 years so that God's people could traverse back and forth with their new glorified bodies in Revelation 21, verses 9 to 22, 15, now comes down to earth. Revelation 21, 1 to 8. And now there are none of the things we ever knew before. There is no Satan. There is none of the sin we know. All of these spirits are bound forever and forever in a place called Gehenna. As I said before, prepared specifically for the devil and his angels, and then in that judgment, Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15, for all those also who followed this terrible being. And I said this a while ago, and I will repeat it, Rexella. If you know the Lord, you don't have to worry about any of this. Why? Listen to Paul again in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am persuaded, I am convinced, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities and powers, names for the evil spirits, nor things present, nor things to come in the future, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. Doesn't matter what shows up in the future. Nothing, not another creature. All these things combined cannot separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I think it's time for some of you to receive the Savior and let Christ Jesus do this work in your heart. Would you look at me and pray this right now? Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the cross. Thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for washing away every taint, every stain of every iniquity and sin I ever committed. Sins that happened because I allowed the spirit world of fallen angels to influence me and often control me. I want to be free today. Jesus, as you set the gathering demoniac free, and he was now clothed and in his right mind. I want that experience. For sin has certainly botched my thinking and mine. Lord Jesus, cleanse me today. Wash me. Save me. Liberate me. Free me. I know you'll do it because I trust in you now. Come into my heart. Lord Jesus, in your name I pray this. Amen. Amen, Jack. If you prayed that prayer, you can say with the little lady that I talked to not long ago, and she said, you know, Rexella, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know the one who does. How wonderful to know God. He knows the future. And he'll take care of you. He'll take you to heaven when this life is finished. And if you have made a decision for the Lord, would you please write to me? I'd love to send you absolutely free a little booklet entitled First Steps in a New Direction. It, I think, will be a real blessing to your life as you walk with the Lord. We remember this about the Word of God. God's Word is the compass that keeps you on course. Bye-bye.